Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English, Learn to Speak English Like a Native. Join my VIP program and commit to my VIP program and you will speak English powerfully. You will speak English fluently. You will speak English effortlessly. You will think in English. You must commit and join my VIP program today or stay, remain a VIP member keep doing the lessons keep working at it each day each day just just need to listen each day that's all very simple but very powerful so join and or remain a vip member go to effortlessenglishclub.com join at effortlessenglishclub.com My pronunciation course is a great addition to the VIP program. Works well together with the VIP program. It's a good combination, those two. VIP plus the pronunciation course. This combination, both of them together each day, will increase your improvement very, 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 very fast. Your improvement will speed up by doing both of those together. It's really a superpower combination. You're going to see big improvements very quickly. That's my VIP program plus the pronunciation course, both available. Get them today at EffortlessEnglishClub.com, EffortlessEnglishClub.com. I am on the beach right now. See if I can see if you can hear the water. I'll take the uh, microphone up to the edge of the water. See if you can hear it. It's very quiet, but we'll try. Listen carefully. I don't know if you can hear that. The waves are very, 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 very small here. It's a very calm beach. The water is very calm. I am sitting right next to it, watching the beginning of the sunset. Oh, the sun's still a bit high. We're probably, uh, let's see, oh, hour and a half from sunset, something like that. But the sun's low in the sky. And we've got a beautiful view of the ocean and the beach. Very relaxed. As you might guess, I'm still on the island of Guam. Guam is in the South Pacific Ocean. Here's a quote from the alchemist. A quote from the alchemist. When you can't go back... You only have to worry about the best way of moving forward. When you can't go back, you only have to worry about the best way of moving forward. And this is talking about it. It's, it's what Santiago's situation when he was stuck. In North Africa, he'd lost all his money. He didn't have enough money to go home. So he was stuck there. He could not go back. He did not have enough money to go back. He had no choice. And so he didn't have to worry about that. He didn't have to think about quitting at that time because he had no, no option, no choice to go backwards. 
to give up, to quit. He had to go forward somehow. At that time in the story, he had to figure out how to get some money, how to survive. And now he did think maybe in the future he could make money somehow and make enough money and then eventually go home. But at that exact moment in the story, he did not and could not worry about going back to Spain. He had to move forward somehow. He had to find a solution immediately and had to find a way to move forward and make money again. Keep living. Keep going forward. Keep finding opportunities and solutions. And that's what he did, of course. And then when he finally made enough money, he, of, he of course, he realized, well, why well, go home? I can keep going towards my dream. Keep going towards the pyramids. When I read that quote, I immediately thought of the very famous story. Of course, Cortez, the Spanish explorer, came to the New World, what is now Mexico. And Cortez landed, and of course, it's the very famous story with his ships. They didn't know what they were going to find. They had no idea, right? It was quite scary for them, quite frightening. They arrive on a beach. They're, they've got their ships. They're, there's just jungle and unknown land to explore. Frightening. They don't know. Can, are they, can they survive? Will they be able to get enough food? Uh, are, are they going to be killed by the locals? They didn't know. And so, of course, there's a lot of fear and uncertainty. So what did Cortez do? He ordered the burning of his ships. He burned his ships which seems quite crazy and I'm sure his men were uh, not so happy about it at the moment but he did it for exactly this reason of what this quote says that when you can't go back right when going back is impossible in the moment then your only choice is to go forward you have your only choice is to focus on how to go forward what's the best way to go forward you start looking for opportunities instead of wanting to quit. That's why Cortez burned his ships. Because then his men would stop thinking about quitting. They would stop thinking about going home because they realized, oh my God, we're stuck here for at least for a while. We have no choice. It would take a very long time to build new ships. And we will starve before we can do that, right? we won't have enough food. So we've got to figure out what to do. We've got to go forward. We have to explore. We've got to find food. We've got to solve problems and find a way to go forward and survive. So it's a more aggressive, a more confident, a more positive, a more active, proactive mindset, right? When you cut off, when you eliminate the choice of quitting, the choice of going back. And that's exactly what Cortez and his men did. They charged forward, exploring, and, you know, most of you probably know the history, but they basically invaded and uh, got lots of gold, money, gold at that time. They found cacao, chocolate. Thank you, Cortez, for that. <laughs> destroyed the Aztec Empire and the rest is history as we know and of course eventually they were successful they kept going forward when you have this mindset or sometimes it's not a mindset sometimes it's really just the situation you really just can't go back in fact, I'd say this all happens a lot of times in life. After you make a strong decision about something, you make a big change in your life that sometimes the change is so big that it's impossible or almost impossible or at least very, very, very difficult to go back again to the old way of living before your decision. So sometimes just your decision causes this. Sometimes it's more of a mindset, like with Cortez, a choice. But either way, 
It gives great power, great mental, psychological, and emotional power, right? Because it focuses your energy on moving forward instead of complaining, instead of focusing on all the bad stuff and wanting to quit and wanting to give up and, oh, life's not fair and, oh, my situation sucks and, oh, how can I escape it? No, you, you're just forced to solve problems, move forward more aggressively, more confidently. It's a more confident, active mindset when you cut off retreat, right? When retreat, when going backwards is no longer a choice in your mind or in reality, you will usually have much more success because this eliminates so much of the, the worry and doubt, right? You gain a great deal of commitment. I mentioned that at the beginning, just here at the beginning of the show, this word commitment. You've got to commit to the VIP program, for example. You've got to commit to improving your English. Commitment means a strong decision that you won't change. You're not going to change your decision, you know, next week or next month because oh, you have a bad day or you're not feeling good or your motivation goes down or you have some problems or some worries or whatever. No, you're going to stay with your decision. Commitment means making that strong decision and then not changing it. You're going to keep doing it, keep doing it. You will not quit. That's commitment. Commitment is super, super powerful. It's hard to accomplish, it's hard to achieve anything difficult, anything meaningful, really, without strong commitment. Without commitment, you will be tempted you will want to quit, and you are more likely to quit. Right? So if you join the VIP program, right, you join, but if then if you quit after one month, of course you're not going to speak powerfully or fluently, right? You don't have the commitment. That's the same, like, imagine if you're a parent, or imagine if your parents did this. And unfortunately for some kids, this does happen, where... The parents aren't committed. Mom or dad don't fully commit. I mean, imagine that. If they, oh, yeah, I'm going to have a child. I'll have a baby. And then after the baby's born, they just say, ah, I don't want to do this. It's too difficult. After six months, the baby's crying. They're not getting enough sleep. So they just leave. Right? No commitment. No commitment to being a mom or a dad, a parent. Now, we know what happens in those situations. It's not good. Those children suffer a lot. You know, some manage to grow up to have good lives. But many, many, many don't. It's definitely not a good situation. It is possible to get through that situation. But it's not a good one. Right? And we don't respect parents who do that, who don't commit fully to raising their children. It's the same for health or fitness, right? You want to, let's say you're uh, overweight yes, and you're not so healthy and you want to be healthy. Well, guess what? That's something you have to do every single day, right? Being healthy, it's not just something you do a few days and then, you're, then it's done. It never ends as long as you're alive, right? It's every single time you choose to eat. <laughs> you have to commit, stay committed to eating those healthy foods every day. Or if we're talking about fitness and exercise, well, you got to do it every day or at least many times per week. Right? If you don't have that commitment, if you decide to quit, you decide to go back to your old way of living, well, very quickly you'll get fat again. Very quickly your energy will go away again. Very quickly you'll become unhealthy again. Right? If you... If you allow yourself to go back you will suffer also just in your mind if you if you allow yourself to have that choice if you allow yourself the choice of going back again well then you're more likely to quit you're more likely to quit when you're more like Cortez and you cut off all possibility in your mind at least 
And when it's not even a choice anymore, well, then you just move forward. Then you just think, how? How can I become more fit? Oh, maybe you lift weights and, oh, you don't like that. So then you change and you do push-ups and pull-ups and, oh, you like that better. And you try running. No, I don't like that, but, oh, you, then you try cycling and, oh, cycling you really like, right? So you, you, you're, you're, you're just looking for ways to become more fit. You're looking for ways to exercise that you love and enjoy. And, yeah, sometimes maybe you try one and you don't like it, but you don't quit. You never go back. You just go forward. So if you try running and you don't like running and it hurts your knees or something like that, well, you don't just quit and go back. Going back is not a choice. No, you just think, okay, well, I don't like running because it hurts my knees. What's another way I could exercise that would be more gentle for my knees since I'm having knee problems? And so maybe you try riding a bike. Cycling is generally easier on knees or if you really, really want something that's super soft on your knees or joints, you could do swimming. So you try different things and then you find the kind of exercise that works for you. you going back is not a choice. Your only choice, like in this quote from the alchemist, is you know, how to go forward. What's the best way to move forward? That's what you focus your mind on. What's the best way to move forward? You just keep asking yourself that question again and again and again. What's the best way to move forward towards this goal that I have? And you, know, you might not know immediately. You might have to try several different things, just like Santiago. And he has to ask this question many times during the story. What's the best way to move forward? What's the best way to keep going? What's the best way to get to the pyramids? What's the best way to get my to my treasure? And he has to change his answer many times, right? First he thinks, well, I just uh, sell my sheep, get a ticket over to North Africa, pay somebody, and then I go. Easy. But then he does that, and then his money gets stolen. So he has to ask the question again. What's the best way to move forward? Well, then he ends up, what? He works in the crystal shop, the tea shop. And he has to ask that question again. What's the way, best way to move forward? What's the best way to move forward? And he, he thinks of lots of ways to make more money at the tea shop, the crystal shop, how to improve that business, how to learn more skills. Right? And then he saves up a lot of money, and he has to ask the question again. What's the best way to move forward? Ah, I'll join the caravan. So he does that. He meets the Englishman. What's the best way to move forward? Well, well maybe re learning something about this alchemy stuff. Sounds quite interesting. So he learns some about that. And then they arrive at the caravan, and we will see in our next show, which will be next week when I get back to Japan, you'll see that he has more challenges, more difficulties, more problems <laughs> in the caravan. And, and and then after, I mean, uh, excuse me, not a, in the caravan, after the caravan arrives at the oasis, the oasis, right? They travel, the group, the, is, the group is the caravan, that are travelers, and the, lo they, the location they just arrived at, it's not, it's not the caravan, the location is the oasis. The caravan arrived at the oasis, that's what we just finished. So it gets to the oasis, that's where there's water in the desert, and we'll see in the, in the De in the desert oasis, he has more challenges, more problems to overcome. And he keeps, but he keeps asking this question, how to keep moving forward. And at this point in the story, he really, once he gets to the oasis, he stops thinking about going back. Because now he's closer, right? He's closer to the pyramids than to Spain. It's now easier to keep going forward than to turn around. It's closer to get to Egypt the pyramids, because he's already in Egypt when he gets to the oasis. The oasis is in, e in Egypt. So if he's so close now, it's crazy to go back. He's not even going to think about it. And this happens in life too, that in the beginning, it's easier to turn back, to quit, because it seems like, oh, it's so close, and the goal that you want seems far away. But as you keep going forward and making progress, and you just focus on that, you start to get closer and closer and closer until it starts to feel like it's getting close now. It starts to feel like you're getting near. And at that time, you think, well, I'm not going to quit now. That would be crazy. I'm not going to quit. I'm getting, I'm so close now. It, be, it would be crazy to quit. 
And that's a great thing. This is a very good mindset. I like this quote. When you can't go back, you only have to worry about the best way of moving forward. Keep a forward focus, a forward focused mindset always. How do I move forward? What's the best way to move forward? That's a great question to constantly ask yourself in life. It's an adventurer mindset. It's an explorer mindset. It's a winner's mindset. Ah, on Twitter, I had a quick question, a pronunciation question from Peter, so I'm going to answer it now in the show. He wanted to know how to pronounce two different words that are a little bit close in spelling. One is literary, and the other is literally. Hmm. Let's talk about what the, the meaning first. Literary, literary, literary means um, about literature. About literature, connected to literature, having to do with literature. So if you have a literary project, it means it's a project, it's a literature project, right? It's a project, what kind? It's a literature type. Literature type. Literature, of course, means writing, usually fiction, fiction writing. That's literary. We might say, he's a literary genius, we might describe a writer. He's a literary genius. Right? He's a genius at writing literature. He's a genius at writing fiction. So that's literary. And then the other one is literally. Literally. Literally means uh, directly. It means, it, has, it means having the di same exact direct meaning of words. Literally, this is a very common word. We use this literally a lot. A lot of people, including Americans and Brits, native speakers, a lot of people use this incorrectly. They, they don't understand the meaning of this word, and they use it in an incorrect way. So let's, let's learn how to use this word correctly, literally. Let's imagine we have, uh, you're, there's, you're on the beach like I am, and then you're walking on the beach, and up ahead you see something really, really big. Looks like a like a whale, a sm like a small whale on the beach, right? But it's a, actually it's a man. It's a, it's a big, 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 fat man. You say, "Oh my God, that guy is a whale. He's a whale." Right? That's a metaphor, right? You're comparing him to a whale. He's not really a whale, right? So it's not the direct meaning. This is an indirect meaning. Right? It's a metaphor. It's kind of like poetry. It's a way of describing this fat person. That guy's, that guy's a whale. He's, he is a whale. He's not really a whale. It's not the direct meaning. We're just comparing him to a whale, saying he's as fat as a whale. So that is not literally, not literally, that's called figuratively. He's figuratively a whale, <laughs> right? It means we're not talking about the direct, 100% direct meaning of the words. We're just using it to compare like, like poetry or something. On the other hand, if we saw something big up on the beach and it actually was a whale, it was really a whale, and, and you say, oh my God, that is a... That is literally a whale on the beach. Well, that means it really is a whale, right? You're not, you're not exaggerating. You're not using uh, a comparison, right? You're not trying to be clever. You're not trying to joke. No, it really actually is a whale. It is literally a whale. Okay, so that's the meaning of that second word. Let's talk about the pronunciation, because that was the question on my Twitter. It was about the pronunciation. Literary. There's two keys to pronouncing these words correctly, so they sound different. Key number one is stress. 
It's the stress. Which syllable do you stress? On the first one, literary, which has to do with books, literature, right? Literary. It's the second, right? The final syllable, the final sound, that airy. You should say that most strongly, most loudly, with the most force, right? You want to stress the second half. It's not literary. It's liter, literary, right? Literary, literary, literary. And you can exact, when you practice pronunciation, it's often good to exaggerate for a while, to do it super strongly, really too strongly, because this helps you get the sound right. So literary, 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 literary. Literary, literary, kind of stress that s that last syllable. Literary, literary. That's not exactly correct, but it will help you pronounce it more correctly. Because that's the part of the word that's different than the other one. Literary, 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 literary. Literary. Say that airy very clearly. Literary. 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 Liter. Litter. Litter. Start with the beginning. Litter. 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 And then airy. Litter. Airy. Litter. Airy. Litter. Airy. So after you exaggerate that, you practice that for a while, you say the last part the most uh, clearly, most strongly, just so you get the sound correct. Then, when you say it more quickly, it's really more the middle that gets the stress. Literary. Litter. 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 Right? Litter. Airy. Litter. And there's a pause. Litter. Pause. Airy. Litter. Airy. Again, I'm exaggerating. I'm making everything sound too much. But that's how you pr improve your pronunciation is by exaggerating. Litter. Airy. 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 That's normal speed. Litter. Airy. Okay, now the second word, literally, literally, only is the way this, the last part of the word is, is pronounced. Ali, literally, literally, Ali, 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 not airy, Ali, 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 right? So again, if, when you first practice, just get this, the last part of the word correct because that is where it's different than the other word. So you've got to get that pronunciation very clear and very different from literary, literary. And this one is liter ali, liter ali, 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 right? Airy is the first word. Ali is the second word. Ali. And then again, you add that litter. Literally. Literally. Literally, right? And again, put a little pause between litter and ali. That'll make it even more clear with that little pause. The other person will clearly hear the last part of the word, which is important because the first part's exactly the same. So literally, literally, full speed is literally, literally. He is literally whatever, right? He's literally a whale. No, it's not a person. It's literally a whale, a real whale. Okay, enough of that. Back to this commitment, right, about you can't go back. When you can't go back, it actually makes you more strong, more powerful. Why? Because indecision creates weakness. Indecision destroys confidence. Indecision creates worry and doubts. Indecision is the opposite of decision, right? Decision a strong decision means you have commitment, right? You're not even thinking about quitting. It is 100% decision. 
decision. The adjective is decisive. You're decisive. You make a decision, and then now you're not going to change it. That's decisive. The opposite is indecisive. We're talking about the adjective now. Indecisive is the opposite. Indecisive means, uh, right, you know, people like this. And probably you are like this sometimes. Everybody can be indecisive sometimes. Where it's like, ah, I don't know. Uh, uh, and you make one decision, but then, oh, you're not sure. Then you change the decision. Oh, and then you change it again. And, uh, uh, right, you're indecisive. Indecisive equals weakness. It creates weakness. It creates doubt, right? Because you make a decision, but then you're not sure. Oh, maybe, maybe this is the wrong decision. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't do this, right? Again, it's like if you join the VIP program and you try it, and then after two weeks or after a month, you're like, oh, well, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I should do something else instead. Uh, uh, and then uh, I'm not sure. And then you quit the VIP program. Um, oh, maybe I'll try... Um, I don't know, Berlitz. And then you, you try Berlitz. Ah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I'm going to do Berlitz. And then you do Berlitz, but then you do that for two weeks. And then you have doubt again. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, this is really boring. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Uh, right? And you just jump around, and you never commit. You never stay with one thing long enough, so you don't improve much. Your results are bad. That's why indecision, it's the noun, indecision, creates weakness. Indecision destroys your ability to move forward because you're always looking back. You're always looking back at your decision you just made. And you're always questioning. Oh, oh you look back. Well, should I do this? Should I not? Uh, was this a good decision? Was this a bad decision? I don't know. Uh -huh. Right? It causes you to look back. And when you're looking back, you're going to crash. Tony Robbins uses this example sometimes. When you're driving a car, right, you look forward. You look through the front window. If you look at the back mirror, right, the mirror, we call the rear view mirror, if you look in the rear mirror all the time, you're going to crash. You're going to hit something because you're looking behind you, but you're driving forward and you're going to crash. You need to be looking forward most of the time. It's okay. Sometimes, occasionally, occasionally, okay, not often, just rarely. It's okay to occasionally check your mirrors when you drive. Sometimes you need to. You need to back up a little bit. Or you just need to check behind you. And in life, this is also true. Sometimes you need to you know, look at your past and just learn something from it. Ask yourself some questions. Try to learn something from it. But... Then you go forward again. Most of the time when you're driving, you must be looking forward to be safe and to go where you want to go. And same in life. Most of the time you must be focused forward. A forward focus gives you much more power, much more confidence, much more energy, and much, much, much better results. In fact, it's better to be decisive even if your decision's not the number one best one. Right? This is what causes people to be indecisive. They think, is this the very best decision? Oh, I don't know. And, they, and then they, they look back. No, 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 no. Just go forward. Commit and go forward. And then later, as you're going forward, then you might find another opportunity. You might find an even better improvement. And then you do that and you make your next decision and then you make a net right you're always making decisions but every decision moves you forward you never look back and doubt and oh my god did i make the right decision oh no the other thing that makes you weak is is regret right or blame when you're constantly looking at your past this happens with a lot of people when um, something bad happens in their life and then they just focus on it. And the rest of their life, they use this bad event as an excuse, as the reason why their whole life is terrible. The reason why they have all their life problems. It's because, like some people blame their parents. Because my mom and dad were bad parents, right? Maybe dad left. Maybe mom left. Maybe they just were not very nice. So yeah, that sucks. 
Nobody wants that, but it happens sometimes. But some people that happens, and they they become adults, and they say, "Well, I got, I'm moving forward. It's my life now. I'm an adult now. I make my decisions. The past is done. I'm not happy about what mom and dad did, but I got to go forward. I'm moving forward now. They're not focused on that. They don't keep focusing on it because it's done. It's over. They try to learn from it." as best they can but then they're focused on going forward 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 but some people decide to become lifelong victims they decide to constantly focus on how bad their parents were and they're 25 years old and they're still talking constantly about their bad parents and then they're 30 years old and they're still blaming their parents for everything and all their problems in life And then they're 35, and then they're 40, and they're still talking about their terrible parents. They're looking backwards. They're trying to drive by looking backwards. And no surprise, they continue to have more and more problems in life. Because they don't learn and move forward, so they become weak, and they have a victim mindset. They develop this victim mindset where they their identity is, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. I am a victim. It's all bad. We have whole groups of people do, that do this. In the United States, we have groups, whole large groups of people who say, oh, in the past 200 years ago, my people, something bad happened to them. Right? Let's say, oh, the, the white people killed a lot of my people 200 years ago, or they did something else bad. And then... They're still focused on it. It's 200 years later. They weren't even there. They weren't even alive at that time. It's long gone. And right now in their life, they have many opportunities. They could live a great life, but no, they want to focus on being a victim. They stay focused on the past. Blame, 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 blame. Blaming people who were not even alive at the time the bad stuff happened. It's insane. It's crazy, but it makes them weak. It makes them very weak. So they usually do badly in life. And then when they have bad results in life, they blame the past again, which makes them even weaker. And it's a downward spiral, right? It never ends. It just gets worse and worse and worse. And these people become more and more angry, more and more unhappy, blaming, blaming, blaming all the time. Everybody else causes their problems. It's always someone else or groups of other people who cause them to be unhappy, who cause them to fail, who cause them to have problems. That's what the victim mindset will do to you. That's what the victim mindset will create. It creates a terrible life looking backwards because you can't change the past. This is why it makes you powerless. It's a powerless mindset because you're focused on something you cannot change. The past cannot be changed. So when Santiago, right, the thief, stole his money, was he happy about his money being stolen? Of course not. Was he happy that the guy lied to him and cheated him? Of course not. Was he happy to be stuck in Africa with no money in a strange place, not knowing what to do? Of course he was not happy. And for a few moments, he started to focus on it, right? He complained like everybody does. We all do that in the moment when it happens. But then he realized, well, I have a choice. Focusing on this will not help me. It's over. It's in the past now. I can't change it. I can't change it. I can't. The guy has disappeared. He's gone. I'll never find him. I'm not getting my money back. So complaining about it all the time will change nothing. Thinking of myself as a victim will not change anything. The money won't come back. I can cry and say, I'm a victim, and he was bad, and he he did this bad thing to me, and oh, I'll never get my dream now. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. He could do that. He could have done that. But he realized it would just make him, make himself weaker and weaker and weaker. It would not solve his problem at all. In fact, it would do the opposite. It would create even more problems for him, making him miserable. So what did he do? He just said, well, this quote from the book I just read. 
I can't go back, so I got to focus on moving forward. What's the best way to move forward? He just asked the question, and he went, and he, right, he, he created, really, he, he aggressively created that new job at the crystal shop. He created that opportunity, and it worked out very well for him, finally, after a lot of hard work. It's easy. Look, difficult things happen to all of us. All of us. Bad things happen to everybody. Even people you think have so much luck and everything's so great for them, right? And people who are millionaires and billionaires and everything seems great. You don't know. You don't know their life. You're not sure. You don't know their past. You have no idea. <laughs> I mean, maybe terrible things happened to them when they were small. Maybe their parents were terrible. Maybe they've had other terrible things happen or painful things happen. Probably because everybody does. It happens to everybody at some point. So, again, it's crazy to cry and cry and cry forever and think of yourself as a victim and constantly be looking back. Because everybody has the choice. This is a choice all of us must make. It's possible for everybody to think of themselves as a victim. At some point in your life, you have that choice. We all do. We can always find something bad that happened to us that was not fair and then say, I'm a victim and just focus on the past, the past, and make ourselves weaker and weaker. Or as I said, some people, it, nothing happens to them personally, so they focus instead on like their ancestors, on their great-great-great-grandparents. Something bad happened to them. And they use that as an excuse to be a victim, which is just crazy. And they say, oh, racism's the problem. That's why I have all these problems. Uh, right? Then they use all these words, racist and sexist and all this stuff. Looking backwards makes you weak. It makes you a victim. It will destroy you. It will destroy all of your happiness. Don't do it. Do what Santiago did. Just ask this question. What's the best way to move forward now? What's the best way to move forward now? You decide, you move forward, you keep going. Okay, I'm going to end with uh, another update. Gab is back. Yay! See, they did the right thing. The owner owners of Gab could have decided to focus on all the unfair stuff happening because it's very unfair. The Silicon Valley communists are being very unfair. The banking system is being very unfair. Right? This is war though. This is war. And in war there's no point crying about unfair. Right? I'm here on Guam where the Japanese and the Americans fought just a terrible, terrible, bloody, horrible battle during World War II when the Americans were invading this island and thousands and thousands were dying. Do you think it would help one of them, a Marine, do you think it would help them to say, this isn't fair? This isn't fair. Those Japanese guys are being mean. It's not fair that they're bombing us. It's not fair they're shooting at us. No. Okay, it's war. That's what happens. The other guy tries to destroy you. They are your enemy. They're trying to kill you, to destroy you. So those Marines did not cry about all that. They just charged and they fought and they fought and they fought. And they, of course, tried to do exactly the same thing back to the Japanese, and they won. Well, this isn't a shooting war we're in, but we are in an information war, a political war and in many ways an economic war. The communists are evil and they will do this. They will continue trying to silence us. They will continue calling you a racist or a sexist or Islamophobe or a transphobe or whatever other stupid word they can think of because they don't have any real arguments. They don't have real arguments. They don't have anything rational or real, so they just will call you names. That's what they do. 
And the second thing they will do, because they cannot win arguments, they cannot win with free speech, they will try to censor, to silence. They're going to continue doing that as much as they can. Okay? They're trying to destroy us. You have to realize this. This isn't just some little debate. This is not just a, an argument between two sides. This is war. They want us destroyed. They hate us. They want us destroyed and silenced completely. They do not want you to be able to say anything that you believe in that they don't like. They want to silence all speech that they disagree with. They want total control. They want George Orwell. They want Animal Farm. They want 1984. That is what the socialist, the communist, the leftist, whatever name you want to use, that is what they want. And we know this. George Orwell wrote about this way back in the 1940s. Okay, this is old. They have been doing this for years and years and years. They will always do this because that is who they are. So this is a war. Do not expect them to be fair. Do not expect to argue with them rationally and they will change their minds. Do not expect to convince them of anything. They are just trying to destroy. They will lie. They will cheat. They will do everything possible they can with their power until they are completely defeated. Okay? You have to think of this as war, and you should be happy, I know I'm happy, that it's not a shooting war. I'm happy I don't have to be a Marine charging the beach on Guam as the Japanese shoot at me and kill, possibly sh shoot and kill me and kill all my friends. Okay, we're lucky that our war is just a battle on the internet and a battle of words and in some ways a battle of economics. I know it's seems scary sometimes. I know it's frustrating, but it's still <laughs> it's still a lot better than full real war. Ask anybody who actually fought in a real war. I'm sure they will tell you it's much better what we're dealing with. So I get angry and I get upset too, but we have to realize this is war. It's not fair. What they're trying to do to Gab is not fair. We have to break and destroy Silicon Valley. It's going to take a long time, a lot of fighting. We have to support our allies, people who value uh, free speech and truth, family and patriotism, goodness. You know, so we support groups like Gab. I don't completely love the owner of Gab. He has some personality things I don't like very much, but overall he's on the right side and I'll support Gab because it supports free speech for non-communists. So that's what we do. We keep fighting. I got a message on Twitter today of someone from India about you know, these kind of crazy socialist feminists attacking their religion in India. And the guy was very upset. But this is what they do, okay? You can't, there's no point getting upset about it. I know in the moment, of course, you'll get upset, but then you have to calm down and you have to think like a soldier. This is war. This is a global war. They want total control. They want to destroy everything you believe in. They want to destroy all of your traditions, all of your beliefs. They want to destroy your religion. They want to destroy morality. They want to destroy goodness. They want to destroy truth. They want to destroy economic freedom. They want to destroy and control all speech, free speech. And they will lie and cheat and censor and do everything else. Use bribery. They will do everything they can. They control most of the media, the big corporate media. Remember, these are corporate communists working together with government. And if you start feeling bad, you have to look at the people who are fighting and doing well against them. There are patriots in the United States. The whole Q army, people, followers of Q, are fighting back. And luckily, again, luckily we can just do it on the internet and in, a, in peaceful ways. We can fight this battle peacefully right now. If we don't fight now, there will be no more peace. That's when the shooting happens. We see what happens. We know. Read Animal Farm again. We know what happens when these 
communists, when the pigs, when the socialists, the feminists, all these people, when they get enough power, they start killing people. They shoot people. They kill people. Just like the pigs did with the dogs, right? That's what they do. So now's the time to fight, fight, fight them with everything peacefully. But don't expect it to be fair. Don't expect it to be nice. It's going to be, you got to be mean and tough sometimes. And you never quit. And if they call you a sexist, if they call you a racist, you just laugh in their face and you keep attacking them and you keep fighting and fighting until you win. Just like Mr. Bolsonaro did down in Brazil. I like to call him Bolsonaro. It's a wrong pronunciation, but because he has balls. <laughs> okay. And in English, that's a good I idiom for when you say a guy has balls. That guy has balls. Right? It means he's not afraid, right? He's tough. He's strong. He, he, he won't run away from a fight. He'll, he'll do the right thing and he'll, he'll say the right thing and he's not afraid of you. And he'll keep fighting and fighting and fighting. He has balls. Bolsonaro has balls. Trump has balls. And that's why people like them. Salvini in Italy has balls. Right? We're seeing this around the world. It's popping up. And it's not just these individual people. These individual people don't really have power. It's the people who are supporting them. That's where the power comes from because people around the world are waking up and they are sick, sick, sick of this political correctness. They are tired and angry about all of this censorship. They are tired of the attacks on truth and goodness. They are tired of the attacks on families, on the idea of family and marriage and children and morality and truth people are really sick of it they're tired of the fake news corporate media everywhere in the world and so we're fighting back it's fighting back in Saudi Arabia they're fighting back too so it's everywhere it's, it's in all different countries it's all different uh, continents cultures it's happening in different ways with each country but that's what you do you fight you fight you fight you fight it doesn't happen immediately right even now we're fighting and winning in some places but it's not close to being over there's a long fight to go so you keep fighting okay you got to stay strong because it's, it's a war okay this is not going to be won or lost in just a few months or even a few years this is a war they have been attacking us. They have had so much power for so many years. So we need probably many years of fighting back, fighting back. Because this is the first time in a very long time that good people and families, people who value truth and tradition and all that's good, this is the first time in a long time where we are finally standing up and fighting back. They almost had total control. And if we don't fight, they will. So this is just my way of saying, hey, you got to keep your morale up. Morale is very important in battle. Of course, in a real fight when people are shooting and bullets and explosions, morale is super important. Morale is, right, that feeling of courage, not feeling like a victim, not feeling weak, having the, that strength, that power to keep fighting and keep going or you're not going to give up. You don't, you're not crying. You're not complaining. That's morale. And in fighting, super important. I mean, the Marines who attacked this island, they suffered and suffered so much, but they kept their morale high and they kept moving forward and fighting against an enemy, the Japanese, who were super, super, super tough. The Japanese also had very high morale. That's what made them such a tough, tough, tough army to fight against. So this is one reason the, the, the battles were so horrible because both sides had high morale and they weren't going to quit. This is just the truth of battle and this is what we must do. Now, luckily, figuratively, not literally. We're not literally fighting with our fists. We're not literally fighting with any kind of violence at all. The good news is we're fighting with words. We're fighting with votes. We're fighting with our spending, right? And that's much more peaceful. And even though it does seem very, very frustrating and makes you very angry sometimes and upset, 
you just got to stop yourself and say, ah, hey, it could be worse, okay? <laughs> it could be much, much worse. And then you calm down and you realize this is a long fight. You got to keep the morale up. Complaining doesn't help. Right? You have allies. You have friends who are fighting with you. Keep their morale high. Keep their confidence high. Encourage them. Don't bring them down by complaining. Don't look back. Don't be, get a victim mindset. Just keep asking that question. What's the best way to move forward now? What's the best way to move forward now? What's the best way to keep fighting, keep fighting, keep fighting, and move forward now? That's true with this global battle. It's also true with your English, by the way. It's the same mentality when your motivation drops, when you're feeling tired, when you're feeling bored, when you're distracted, when life gets really busy, when you feel like you're not making progress fast enough. All those little doubts come. It's the same thing. You ask the same question. What's the best way to move forward now? What's the best way to move forward now? What's the best way to move forward now? You don't start having doubts. You keep your commitment and you keep moving forward and you will win. I promise you. I promise you you will be successful. I promise you you will achieve that goal you have with English. This is my promise to you. 100% I promise you. You will do it. I will not promise you that it always will be easy. I will not promise you that you will always feel super motivated every single day. I will not promise you that you won't have difficulties or challenges or problems sometimes because all of those things probably will happen. My promise is simply this. Commit. Keep going. Keep finding every day the best way to move forward. Just keep moving forward little by little, centimeter by centimeter. We say in English, inch by inch. And I promise you, you will do it. Keep your eyes forward. Join my VIP program. Commit to my VIP program. Join right now. Commit right now. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go now to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. That's where you join my VIP program. That's where you also get my pronunciation course. All my other courses. EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Go today. Go now. EffortlessEnglishClub.com.